Well, it's treating kids um, like people, like we would treat anyone. So I, I respect their body autonomy. Um, I try and work with them collaboratively to get things done. If I'm going to hold a limit, I'm going to make sure that that's a limit that I want to hold. It's important to hold because we shouldn't just hold limits just to hold limits. So if there's a limit that I want to hold, it's something that better be important. And I need to give my kids the reason for why it's being held. If it's safety, it's safety. If it's something else, it's another reason. Um, and two, that it's a limit that I actually can physically hold. Can I pause for a second and, and just note that uh, we got Brian on here who's getting uh, Congressman Massey on and our typical lineup includes like homeless people that believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Welcome to the Brian Nichols Show, your source for common sense politics on the We Are Libertarians Network. The Brian Nichols Show is the fastest growing liberty podcast that brings together people from all means of political thought as we seek to have meaningful conversations about the issues you care about. At the Brian Nichols Show, our goal is to leave the audience educated, enlightened, and informed. And now, your host, Brian Nichols. I'm back! Did you miss me? Okay, I, it, it was weird, right? Because I kept the show going, but little did you know, the past week, I have been in Indianapolis visiting the mothership. Chris Spangle and the amazing We Are Libertarians Network all got together out in Indiana at the amazing We Are Libertarians pool party. And oh, what an awesome opportunity to not only see some awesome folks here in the network, but some great friends who flew in. Like uh, we have good friend Elaine Joan uh, and then Jess Mears, of course, you know her. Queen of Clubhouse, uh, we're in the house. Uh, it was so great to, to see friends uh, who we've all met online, but never really had the chance to connect in person. So yeah, it, what a great opportunity to go out there. And yeah, folks, welcome, by the way, back to the Brian Nichols Show. I am your humble host, Brian Nichols, and I am getting back into the swing of things. You can tell I'm still a little cooked here, got my uh, my tan. It, okay, let's be real. It's kind of a sunburn. Uh, and and uh, hey, that doesn't mean we're not going to have some fun today because this conversation is talking about respectful parenting. Now, this is a topic I had never really thought too much about, uh, and I think this is partly why Alex is so important in terms of what she's doing in on, on the conversation today. And that is raising the idea of, and to use her words, modeling to be the person you want your kids to be. It kind of goes in hand, hand in hand with the, the golden rule, treating others the way you want to be treated. And what started this entire conversation was an epiphany that Alex had when she realized the school system failed her, but she realized that her son still had that spark and she wanted to keep it alive. It was a fascinating conversation, something I never really had thought much about, as I mentioned before, and what a great chance for Alex to explain, yes, why she is an advocate for respectful parenting. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure if you're here on the YouTube, give us a thumbs up. But of course, with that being said, onto the show, Alex Hatch here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Thank you for joining the program. I am so excited for today's conversation because as you said beforehand, you have a radical view about education. But before we get there, let's start about uh, talking about the radical version of you. You you obviously are a firebrand here in the greater liberty world. So Alex, with that being said, what brought you on this path of liberty, specifically focusing on kids and uh, their education? Yeah. Um, so I was introduced to libertarianism through my dad. He always identified libertarian. My mom was a Republican, um, but I didn't really embrace those ideas until college. Uh, in college, I read The Fountainhead, then Atlas Shrugged and joined the objectivist um, club that we had there. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, I know Ayn Rand does not like libertarians, but um, the philosophy behind the politics is... Uh, is compatible and certainly the most compatible in terms of yeah, like right. the four different yeah. <laughs> uh, options we have here in the U S. So that's kind of when I started thinking about these ideas. Um, and then I started getting more involved politically after the shutdown. And that's when I had my idea for uh, man to fly in terms of my, uh, let's see, the question also was about kids. In terms of my radical views on um, child rearing and education, that happened after kids. I was not raised in this way. Um, I was raised more traditionally. Um, my parents believed in spanking and I was sent to traditional schools, lots of different types of schools, actually some weird schools and I was homeschooled for a year. Uh, but it was me having kids and seeing my kids grow and develop 
I started questioning the way that we do things and why we do things. Um, and I'm kind of philosophically minded. Like I don't care so much about, uh, how do I put it? Like how, like how things work and maybe what we should do in real life to fix them. I'm more interested in why we do things and how they should be on a philosophical level. Gotcha. Okay. Understood. Yeah. I think we're gonna have fun with that kind of a uh, premise there as we go into the conversation, but I want to rewind to something you said earlier after the shutdown, that's when you really started getting involved in politics. And you know, what's funny, Alex is I've, I've been having more and more of these conversations and I'm hearing more and more that this shutdown really activated a lot of people. And then by shutdown, just for posterity's sake, cause we have 275 plus episodes here in the program, we're recording here on just after July 4th weekend, 2021. We just went through a year and a half of insanity from a government lockdown perspective, truly locking down people in their homes. Alex is over in California. She had it insane, still has it kind of insane with Governor Gavin Newsom and then the wonderful uh, mayor there, Eric Garcetti, who just like destroyed LA. And then up here in the Northeast, we have folks like Bill de Blasio and Mayor Jim Kenney who have been destroying their cities left and right. So that's been fun. Um, but this this lockdown stuff, it's, it's really taken a lot of people and pushed them to say, you know what? I kind of sat in the sidelines for a while and now I'm not going to sit in the sidelines anymore. Is that kind of where you found yourself, Alex? Yes, I voted libertarian for most of my life. And, uh, but I didn't really pay attention to details and, and um, other than the Ron, the Ron Paul movement sparked. So the Ron Paul movement, I donated money to, and he was, that was the first like a uh, political campaign I ever donated money to. Um, and then after that kind of fizzled, then I was just like, oh, I'll vote libertarian. And I was so surprised when the shutdown happened and uh, the, we had this election and then the libertarians were pretty silent about this. And it was pretty <laughs> mind blowing. I was very confused by all that. And that's when I started going, what is going on? Like my people are not, not really, it feels like they're not standing for something I stand for. So that's kind of. It, it, then I started digging deeper and um, I went down the rabbit hole, I guess. <laughs> oh, no, you did, didn't you? Well, right. I get it. I get it because believe it or not, you're not alone. There's a lot of people. I mean, I know in my own circle of of influence and, and people, I mean, just friends, honestly, who overtly non-political and they're like, all right, Nichols, come here, <laughs> talk to me. And asking me because they're like i know you're into politics i know you're into this kind of libertarian world and i know that this isn't working the status quo isn't working and it pushed a lot of people to start saying no enough i'm gonna start looking to other solutions now you you said something also that i wanted to, to circle back to maybe we can turn this more towards your podcast that you have the parenting trap because you talk about you're more philosophical you try to focus on Maybe I would dare say some idealism. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So what what kind of is pushing you that that way? Is there something that has made you want to go into this idealist mentality? Yes. Well, because I have kids and um, I wanted to do the best for them that I can. And I personally have a hard time figuring out how to act if I don't understand the reasons why. So for me, just the way my brain operates, if if I don't understand that, then I won't know what to do. And so I, I, I had kids, I ran into challenging behaviors, I wasn't sure what to do, and I went searching for answers. And in that process, I discovered respectful parenting. I get that. I get wanting to know how things work and why things work the way they work. Having to almost kind of see it drawn out and, and the, the little ties pulled together so you can see point A leads to point Z. Eventually, you just have to see where the strings connect. I, I, I empathize with that. I, I get that quite a bit. So let's now turn that towards your main focus. And that has been parenting. Um, and, and from this mentality of treating kids like basically, dare I say, little people, letting them make decisions and live their lives with the ability to live their lives. So let's kind of set the, the stage here what led you into that kind of mentality for, for kids? Uh, well, one was after having my oldest, um, I saw that he was so curious about the world. I mm. didn't have to force him to learn things. He, he had internal motivation to do that. I didn't have to teach him to walk, talk, sit up, roll, uh, 
whatever, jump, swim. He taught himself to swim and ride a bicycle. Um, I, I saw this little person exploring the world with such curiosity and loving it so much. And I also saw I, I, the school system failed me and I saw the spirit in him that I felt like was crushed in myself. And I wondered how I could nurture that, uh, and not, and not crush it. And so I think that was like a big, a big piece. And then the other piece was, uh, I started running into challenging behaviors and I followed peaceful parenting and respectful parenting. Um, when I was pregnant, I decided I didn't want to resort to spanking. That's how I was raised. And I didn't like the idea of ever enacting a vi like doing violence onto another person, especially an innocent child and my child, it just sounded horrible to me. Um, but I didn't actually have the reasons why that shouldn't be done. And I still thought that kids needed to be, have the carrot and the stick to learn because that's just the way that you train animals. That's, that's kind of how we were all raised with rewards and punishments, um, to manipulate our behavior. But when I saw my kid do these things, I thought, how, how can I nurture that? And then, oh, I kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, <laughs> basically, I didn't know how to deal with challenging behaviors. And I tried some of the peaceful techniques, which are which range anywhere from like time out to, to what? To um, never spanking, but like, you know, withholding privileges, things like that. So they still relied on the carrot and the stick. And when I tried them, they backfired. They were terrible. It didn't work. Um, and so I just, I looked for, I looked for other options. And that's kind of also why I went into the philosophy of it because my ex at the time said, uh, he's my husband at the time said, um, if we just spanked, then we wouldn't have to worry about this problem anymore. The, the situation would be solved. And I kept saying, I don't know why we shouldn't do that. All I know is that we shouldn't do that. Like all the research says we shouldn't spank our kids. Um, but I don't know why exactly and, and why we should do something else. So now you've taken this position of being an advocate for peaceful parenting and respectful parenting. So let's talk about that. What does that look like from being a parent? I mean, you live it every single day. And I'm sure for some parents out there who this sounds completely alien to them, they're just trying to even fathom what it looks like. So Alex, what does this peaceful or respectful parenting look like in, in your home? Uh, well, it's treating kids um, like people, like we would treat anyone. So I, I respect their body autonomy. Um, I try and work with them collaboratively to get things done. If I'm going to hold a limit, I'm going to make sure that that's a limit that I want to hold. It's important to hold because we shouldn't just hold limits just to hold limits. So if there's a limit that I want to hold, it's something that better be important. And I need to give my kids the reason for why it's being held. If it's safety, it's safety. If it's something else, it's another reason. Um, and two, that it's a limit that I actually can physically hold. I don't believe in giving kids limits that you can't physically hold because then you can run into power struggles and you just teach the kid that sometimes when I say that things have to be done, they have the power to say no. And it becomes this really weird power struggle escalation of kind of waiting until they do it or they don't. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> does that make sense? It does. So <laughs> then I guess, let me ask you this. What about values? Because I, I know this is where you, you kind of get into some gray area, right? Where you'll see, I mean, I would say the ideas of, of liberty, not hurting people, not taking their stuff. I would say that's, that's very, I would say it's very basic and okay to teach kids, but is it wrong to want to enforce those values because that's the way that society would want to interact, I guess, in a peaceful, functional manner? Does that make sense? Is my question making sense? It does make sense. It does make sense. Yes. So the difference is I don't think that you can teach kids values um, like that. Like, I don't think you can impose your values on another person through force. Can you show them it? Like, yes, like, that's okay, how you do it. You live it. Right. So I say this all the time. We need to model the, the people that we want our kids to be. So if we want to teach our kids something, we need to be that, 
And that's how, that's the best way that they learn. Model to be the person you want your kids to be. Yep. Treat people the way that you want to be treated. I, I hope people see a reoccurring theme as we go through, <laughs> especially here in the show. Cause so we take things obviously from a sales perspective and part of sales is not pushing a product or a service, but rather trying to help solve a problem and think, how would you want this problem solved? Were you in that person's position? So the same thing is, is very true. I would say when you're kind of correlating this to dealing with kids and let's, kind of address the elephant in the room. Is it fair to say, Alex, that maybe part of the reason we have this old way of parenting, which does kind of go back to this corporal punishment mentality due to just big person, little person, old person, young person, that there is that di that power dynamic where the child really doesn't have the ability to speak up and say otherwise that it does require the adult to maybe listen to other adults and approach things differently. Yes. Um, I would say though that like, okay, this is something I was just talking about with my sister today. Um, I think one of the problems we run into with this traditional parenting is we teach kids that adults are authority figures across the board. And I think that's very harmful and damaging. We need to teach our kids to see people and treat them with respect um, and hopefully respect, uh, expect respect in return. But if the adult is saying something that they might not agree with, or they feel uncomfortable with, then we should empower them to say, mm, I don't agree with you. And that's okay. That should be perfectly fine. Um, and I think that's a big problem with why we have so many adults today who are willing, not just willing, but think it's necessary to have an overbearing state controlling our lives because we're not empowering our kids to make life choices that are best for themselves. So they start to question whether or not they can even do that. Um, and then they grow up thinking the same thing and thinking, okay, well now I need, you know, a different authority figure to tell me how to live. Yeah. Well, and you're not only seeing that there has been a very big switch in the way that parents approach education um, over the past year and a half, much like you, Alex, people were a little shaken <laughs> over what happened over the past year and a half from a government perspective. And in this case, it was keeping kids at home and parents now seeing what was being taught in schools and a lot of parents getting upset because this is the first time that they've actually paid attention to their kids' curriculum that they're they're being taught in school and they didn't like it. So now I think you, you have the ear of parents who are maybe considering doing things in a different way. So let's go to salesperson hat right now, right? Let's talk to those parents directly, parents out there who are now embracing school choice. This is for you. Alex, make your sales pitch to these parents right now. You've been living this life of you know doing the, they will say traditional parenting. Why is now the time to make the switch to a different type of parenting, specifically respectful or peaceful parenting? I don't ever want to tell someone to do something different if they're not ready for it. I think that if everything is working for you and your family and there's a happy dynamic, then, and you're not looking for a change, then keep doing that. That's great. Um, who I want to talk to are the people that that's not working for and that are looking for answers. The people who are confused when their child is exhibiting behaviors and they, they don't know what to do about it. So, oh. Um, if you are a traditional parent and it's working for you, by all means, you can look into these ideas and try them out and see if things go better. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I tend to, I don't want to tell anyone not to live a particular way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Well, how about this? I talk about a rough segue, but Mantafly, I've heard about this Mantafly, uh, it sounded like a, a super villain at first. And then I was told, no, it's. Oh, uh, is it a website that you have crafted? Uh, an application. And the website is not fully functional yet. Um, so right now it's an application. Uh, that By the way, will... I knew it wasn't. I knew it wasn't a, a super villain. I know that, folks. I'm, I'm just bad at jokes, <laughs> I guess. It's, it's been a long day. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. I didn't mean to interrupt. So what's, what's this application do? Uh, it connects 
clients with mobile beauty professionals. So if you want to get a haircut at home, you can download this app and see who in your area will travel to you to offer you that service. How cool. Okay. Lockdown 2020 hits. And what was probably one of the biggest hit industries I know for certain that I haven't seen. I feel bad for even saying it. I haven't seen my hairdresser since March 2020. Like I've been doing my hair at home. Now, granted, I don't have much to worry about in the first place. But nonetheless, I know I'm not unique. But just beyond that, all of a sudden, you have these hairdressers being told you're not essential. So you're giving them a tool not only to now offer their services so they can feed their families, you know, no big deal. But also now the people who are like, hey, can I get a haircut? Because I, I actually have hair on like Brian. Um, can we go ahead and actually arrange that without the state telling the hairdresser that they can't do that or I can't go to their place of business? That, that was a little wacky, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yeah. Well, that was the, one of the reasons I started it. Actually, one of the reasons I started it is because I'm in California and everything was shut down so much later here. It was summertime and I hate shaving, um, but I wanted to be able to wear skirts and shorts out and dresses. So um, I usually get waxed and I couldn't find anyone. And I kept, well, I knew that people were offering that service, Um but it was hard for me to find them. And those people had a hard time finding clients. Uh, eventually I did find someone who would travel to my home and offer me that service. Um, but yeah, I started Mantifly thinking there are so many people out there who, um, that this, I just, this, the whole thing is terrible. You can't, I don't think you can have a government saying who's essential and who's not and take away people's livelihoods. That is utterly offensive to me. Um, so oh, when I had yeah. the idea of Mantifly, I was like, I have to do this. Well, I remember sitting downstairs um, at my old apartment and I remember hearing the governor of, of Pennsylvania utter the words essential and non-essential workers. And I kind of had my Padme Amidala in Revenge of the Sith moment where she's like, so this is how Liberty dies with thunderous applause. I was like, so this is how the marketplace dies with essential versus non-essential worker identifications, I guess like in, and they, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Little did we know that the 15 days to slow the spread where it was just a temporary pause turned into an indefinite pause. So I look at what you're doing. You're offering a solution to a very, very, very real problem. And thank you for doing that. So let's talk future. What's the plan for Mantafly as things go forward? I'm assuming you're having success with the app. So What's down the road for Mantafly and for Alex as we move things forward here? I am not having success with the app. Well, damn it. <laughs> I need help. So if anyone wants to help out with this project, uh, please contact me because that would be amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of went into this blind. This is my first company. I have ideas all the time, but never, I've never spent this much money and time invested in one. Uh, so yeah, the apps, yeah. Um, the apps are not totally finished. They, we need to finish them. I'm hoping that we can get them finished and get people excited about it, bring them on, they start using it. Eventually I would like to expand Mantafly and make it a virtual marketplace. I wanna get cryptocurrency in there and have it be basically like Yelp or Craigslist. The problem with Craigslist you can find, you know, people who travel to your home to offer haircuts on Craigslist, but you don't know if they're any good because every post is anonymous. You don't have a person who has a profile with reviews and history on there to see. So it's in many ways, like a better Craigslist. Once that, hopefully that becomes successful, I'm able to expand. If it makes a lot of money, what I really want to do, what my biggest passion is passion is, is helping kids. And I would like to open up alternative schools in low income neighborhoods and, um, help, help high risk kids, help high risk kids. Let's let's, as we're, and I just looked at the time. I was like, Oh my God, we're already almost at 25 minutes. When that happened, that's what happens when you have fun in these conversations. I've, I'm, I've like, my notes here are just the page is full because you had a lot of good quotes, by the way. I'm still stuck in the model to be the person you want your kids to be. I think that that's going to be the title of the episode right there, but let's talk about these kids, specifically the kids that you're focusing on helping, and, and if we can focus on those kids with alternative forms of education, what would that look like? How would that kind of a schooling system look like in your eyes? 
In my view, the kids that are the highest risk are the ones that do not do well with a traditional school. And they're the ones that end up eventually, a lot of them end up eventually resorting to crime. They feel like they don't fit into society, that nobody gets them. Um, and 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 um, I just, I think that's horrible. And if I could do something to reverse that, I would love to do that. Uh, what I would like to see are democratic schools opened up in all over the place. Um, that's a very radical philosophy where the kids go and they vote on the rules of the school. They vote on the budget, who to hire. There's no classes, no grades, no tests. Um, the kids decide what they want to do throughout their day. And they basically have a tremendous amount of freedom and a tremendous amount of responsibility. And I feel like you have to couple those two things together to, um, to really like allow humans to thrive and flourish. Dig into that. I, I'm fascinated. Tell me more. So what do you mean by the responsibility aspect for kids? Because I, I look at kids as little monsters at times. Um, <laughs> you know, I I I because I mean, let's be real. I was a little kid. You were a little kid. And I know when I, thought, I was a little kid. I was a little monster. So how how can that work? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, that, if that's a rough way of asking that question, mm -hmm. eh? It's great. I love it. I love, I love the questions and I love all the pushback because I know that this is a very radical idea and, oh, it, and is. Yeah. it helps, it helps me to kind of work everything out. Um, yeah. So when you say that you were a monster when you were a kid and I felt, you know, the same way I did that too, um, was it you being a monster just to be a little monster or was it because you were pushing back because you felt like your life had no control? right? Your parents kind of tell you where to go, what to do, sometimes what to wear, what to eat, when to eat, uh, when to go to bed. You have to learn certain things when you go to school. It's extremely stressful because then you're expected to sit down for a certain amount of time in front of a teacher who's going to teach you all this stuff that you don't want to learn. And then you're going to have to regurgitate it back. And at the end, you're going to get a grade. Some kids like that, or at least work with that. And they do fine. Uh, a lot of kids end up rejecting it. And that's what happened to me. I rejected it. I hated it. I was, I would, um, I remember when I was a kid, I used to be in school and I imagined what if I was, what if this wasn't real? I honestly thought, what if this wasn't real or is video being like videotaped and I was on some sitcom and I would just imagine my life like disassociated from what it actually was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's I think I did, I think I did the same thing. I, I'm think like just like playing out scenarios of like what was happening in the like fourth parallel universe to my left. Yep. Yeah, like like that kind of mentality. Yeah, I, I I hear that. I think half the audience is nodding in agreement as well. Yes, and so and so then you kind of you get these kids where um, some kids reject it altogether and they go screw it. I don't even care anymore, and they don't care if they fail and they don't they'll drop out. Some kids like myself didn't want to do that. I didn't want to disappoint my, my parents. Um, and I felt a tremendous amount of pressure to perform, but I hated it so much. So basically I learned how to do the least amount of work possible to skirt by, right. <laughs> Which yeah. is not a great way to live. That's not what we want to teach our kids, like how to just survive. What do we That's call that not... in sales status quo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, and we've said this in the show a couple of times and I know my audience was probably waiting for me to bring it back, but I've always found that the best times to help, you know, teach somebody is, is they'll be learning when they don't realize they're learning and to make it fun, to let them be creative. I mean, I think back to everybody's had the moment where mom and dad are like, all right, little Timmy, you can now stay up as late as you want. No more bedtime. And what does little Timmy do? Little Timmy stays up until 4 a.m. for like four or five days in a row. And guess what? After that fourth day, they're like, this isn't fun. This is stupid. And little Timmy starts to go to bed maybe at like 10 or 11, maybe a little bit later than the nine o'clock bedtime. Now, granted, I like the nine o'clock bedtime because I'm at five, but if I digress, looking at how did little Timmy get to that? How did little Tony learn that? Because he was just going through and experiencing firsthand how it works, how life works and learning from your action, having a direct consequence. I mean, really it's, you burn your hand on the stove, if you will, and it hurts, 
but in a much lesser scaled back way. But then I think it's giving you the chance to now set more realistic boundaries yourself versus just being told, don't do this. And then going to your point, why not? Wanting to question, right? And not having that curiosity filled. I think you're onto something there, Alex. So how about this? Let's want to make sure we point people the right way. If they have in fact had their interest peak and they want to learn more, Parenting Trap, it's a podcast that you co-host. So where can folks go ahead and find that? And I guess really learn all about the respectful parenting uh, and really the peaceful parenting uh, aspect that you've talked about here today in the program. Yeah, so uh, respectful, so... I feel like respectful parenting is under the peaceful parenting umbrella. Peaceful parenting is a lot more broad and I don't like it because it doesn't have a very good philosophy. So it's like, um, yeah. So I would focus on, um, well, what I advocate for is respectful parenting. Our, uh, <laughs> Circling respectful parenting and crossing out <laughs> peaceful parenting, peaceful parenting, not the same. Okay. No, it's, they're similar. They're compatible. They're compatible. Um, it's, it's like the objectivism with libertarianism, more or less. Okay. Yes, I exactly. Feel that. Yep. That's okay. exactly it. Um, okay. So the podcast is called Parenting Trap, and it's on YouTube. It's on all the podcast channels, I'm pretty sure. My sister handles all that stuff. Um, and then uh, my the w website and um, company that I'm working with, on is called Mantafly. And if anyone is interested in helping out with that, um, if you could get in contact with me, that would be amazing. My email address is alex at mantafly.com. That's M-A-N-T-I-F-L-Y.com. And we have a lot of tech gurus who listen to this program. I, I know a, a few of them right now off the top of my head who I'm not going to say their names. So I'm not, I, I know they have their Twitters on private. So but I know you listen, guys. So go help Alex out. And also to the audience, please help Alex out as well. Go ahead, check out her amazing uh, podcast. It's a parenting trap. And yes, mantafly.com. We'll make sure we have that call to action there for all of our techie folks to go help you out, Alex. But with that being said, thank you so much for all you're doing. And thank you so much for joining us here on today's episode of The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you, Brian. This has been amazing. All righty, folks. That's going to wrap up my conversation with Alex Hatch. Yes, respectful parenting. I learned a lot. I think you guys learned a lot. And actually, I think it was good to have that conversation because I think there were some things that even Alex kind of had to reconsider, maybe just like challenge a little bit. So that's always how these conversations are supposed to work. We're supposed to be challenging each other to find the best solutions. And that's what we're looking to do here at the Brian Nichols Show. Solutions that work. And I promise you that the, the solutions-based approach to sales is what is the most effective across the board, whether it's in politics, in business, in life, offering solutions to the problems people see, offering value. And that value, of course, is going to be subjective, but it's on you to show that value. You might have the most important, best product out there, but until you offer the solution and show that it will help solve that problem, but also that there is value in accepting that solution. That is when you will go ahead and actually make the sale. And if you want to learn how to do more about that, don't worry. We're going to go ahead and talk about that in a second. But first, if you enjoy the episode, of course, please, number one, share the episode. That's how we go ahead and reach more people. When you do, please make sure you tag Alex. I will include all of her social media in the show notes. Also, please be sure to in include me uh, at B Nichols Liberty, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Now, Instagram and TikTok, it's going to be more video. And also, I apologize right at the onset here because usually you're supposed to see me do my quick overview of my morning sales huddle. And to my morning sales huddle team for the past four days, I'm sincerely sorry because I have been, again, out of pocket. I've been over in Indiana. I've been busy. I haven't had the moments that I normally do to do the uh, the morning sales huddle. So I apologize. We're going to pick things up here on Friday. Uh, so if you're hearing this Friday morning, of course, uh, yes, go ahead. Check your inbox. You will see the morning sales huddle. And here's a hint. It's going to be about making sure you take time to have some fun because at the end of the day, this is what we do things for. We we have to live and enjoy life. So yes, I, I did take some time and I, I do appreciate your, your support and understanding as not getting your four days there worth of morning sales huddles, but don't worry, they're coming right back. So you're, you're, if you're a audio listener for the first time, you're, you're like, what is he talking about? This morning sales huddle. I apologize. Let me re rewind a little bit. Morning sales huddle is part of the Brian Nichols show Elite uh, and that is folks who want to learn about how to be a better 
um, not just marketer, but sales advocate and solutions-based advocate for Liberty. How do we do that? By being better salespeople individually. So what I've done is, number one, I first developed a, a new ebook. It's free, by the way. So if you're interested, it's, it's called Four Easy Steps You Can Implement Now to Help Sell Liberty to Friends and Family. You can find it at briannicholshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. So number one, that will be sent right to your inbox. Give it a read. And then every single day, Monday through Friday, you will be receiving the morning sales huddle, which is a direct communication from yours truly. And we're going to cover various topics every single day from number one, overcoming objections, figuring out what your buyer wants. Why do people buy and more? All that discussed in the morning sales huddle. So if you wanted to make sure you get the book as well as get in, uh, introduced to the, the brand new morning sales huddle, again, head to briannicholshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. Uh, also, folks, um, looking ahead, uh, and by the way, this is something I'm super excited about, is uh, August, uh, let's see, 5th through the, there we go, yeah, 5th through the 8th, we have Revolution 21 down in Orlando, Florida, Young Americans for Liberty. Uh, they are having Revolution 21. I am so excited to be a part of Media Row. Uh, so if you are going to be attending, please stop by, say hi, get a pictures with yours truly. We're going to have uh, the option for you guys to go ahead and get some swag right there. Um, and you can get some personalized Young Americans for Liberty swag that is going to be Revolution 21 branded as well with yours truly here on the Brian Nichols show. Uh, so make sure uh, you are, if you're interested in getting that as well as uh, learning more about what we're doing here at the Brian Nichols show, heading uh, forward into, my goodness, it's going to be Q4 before we know it. And into 2022, make sure you stop by that booth at uh, Revolution 21 down in Orlando, Florida, part of Young Americans for Liberty, Revolution 21, August 5th through the 8th. Now, if you want to, uh, going back to being a supporting Patreon member, I, by the way, I, I go ahead and I, I, before I talk about Patreon, I, I want to make sure I give you guys a heads up um, in terms of not just the sales huddle, but the ebook, because this is stuff that I want you guys to start applying when we're going to Revolution 21. Um, and when you're out there talking to people, you know, maybe there's some issues that you're super passionate about. Let's think about ways to communicate those ideas. So I want to see this solutions based approach in action at Revolution 21. Stop by the booth. Tell me the successes that you've been having. I want to hear it. Um, now, I go back to if you really want to hone those skills and you want to be the best version of your sales or marketing self, well, you can do that by also becoming a supporting listener of The Brian Nichols Show. I teased it, the Patreon. Yes, head over to briannicholshow.com forward slash support, and you can become a $5 entry-level sales or $10 account-level executive supporter of the show per month. And you'll be getting access to not only this awesome don't hurt people and don't take people's stuff bumper sticker, but you'll be getting access to one-on-ones with yours truly, webinars, conversations with movers and shakers in both the greater liberty world, as well as the business world, leading sales and marketing minds. And of course, conversations with Jeremy Todd, Chris Goizetta, and yours truly, really a masterclass. Plus, Jeremy Todd and Chris Goizetta are uh, going to be giving you guys tons of content from Chris Goizetta's entire marketing library that he has developed as a professor in marketing, as well as Jeremy Todd giving you guys how to be the best sales individual you can possibly be step-by-step. Step. Uh, so if you're interested, again, briannicholshow.com forward slash support. And you can be just like these amazing supporters we already have here in the program. Daryl Schmitz, Laura Stanley, Michael Lemma, Mitchell Mankiewicz, Hody Johns, Craig DaCosta, and the big We Are Libertarians channel. Thank you for you guys taking the step to not only help the program, but to become the best version of yourselves in terms of how you can sell solutions to people, to the problems that they see out there that matter to them, but also by knowing your audience. So thank you to folks. And also one last uh, final plug. Yes, you see me wearing my repeal. Here, I'll lean to the side. Repeal 1913 shirt, uh, which was got uh, gotten, purchased at uh, proudlibertarian.com. Proud Libertarian is also one of our awesome uh, supporters here on the program. We have a collaborative shop, briannicholshow.com forward slash shop. And we have some awesome Brian Nichols, Proud Libertarian branded swag. So head over there. You can check out our Don't Nuke Me Bro, uh, Joe Biden t-shirt. Uh, we have Cool Mask Bro. Um, uh, yeah, bumper sticker t-shirts. That's right. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, yeah, Our good ideas don't require force. Snapbacks, our question everything bumper stickers, as well as our don't hurt people, don't take people stuff bumper sticker. Did you get labeled a Facebook extremist? Well, go ahead. Let people know that it's okay. They're just worried about you 
thinking freely and you can get it personalized, a personalized Facebook extremist uh, warning shirt. Yes, make sure you go to briannicholshow.com forward slash uh, shop and you can go ahead and get your name entered into your own personalized Facebook extremist warning. I mean, uh, they made it too easy for us. Thank you for just the ability to make easy content there, Facebook. Uh, and then also, final thing, make sure you use code TBNS, whether it's at the Brian Nichols Show shop or anything else you're buying at Proud Libertarian, you get 10% off your entire order. And I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, Chris over on Twitter, he said, not only when he purchased the backpack, or not even purchased the backpack, he suggested the idea of a backpack. It was put on the shop, purchased, and then from that moment, to delivery seven days total. How about that? From literally an inception of an idea to Proud Libertarian having it on the shop and then voila, you have a product right there in your, your doorstep, on your doorstep, not in your doorstep, that'd be weird, on your doorstep in seven days. If you want to go ahead and join the amazing team of folks who are starting to rep liberty by piquing interest and using tools at their disposal like that over the Brian Nichols Show shop, please. BrianNicholsShow.com forward slash shop code TBNS at checkout 10% off your order. That's it. That's Friday. I know I missed you guys. We had a lot to catch up on. So coming up here on Sunday. Yes, we're back to the Sunday Candy Highlight Series. Steve Sheets. He is joining us here on the program. He's running for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. He is arguing it's no longer a Democrat issue or a Republican issue. It is a people issue. So why is he running for office as a libertarian? Make sure you tune in on Sunday to get that answer to that question. But with that being said, it's Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show for Alex Hatch. We'll see you Sunday. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.